And welcome back to Political Report. Over the last several weeks, new light has been shed on the many conflicts of interest facing some members of the Supreme Court. Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, has called for ethics reform at the court. But Chief Justice John Roberts has ignored his requests, claiming separation of powers, leading Durbin to consider legislation to impose ethics standards. It's all tied to reported links between Justice Clarence Thomas and the wealthy Republican donor Harlan Crow. It includes real estate purchases, luxury travel, even Thomas's son's school tuition payments, all paid for by the Dallas businessman. Nine black robes inside the Supreme Court's drive to the right and its historic consequences dives into the impact Donald Trump's presidency had on the court and how the court has become increasingly politicized. Joining me now is the author of this incredible book, Joan Biskupic, to look more closely at some of the cases and issues surrounding the court today. Joan, thanks for joining me. Happy Mother's Day to you. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And by the and way, it's I'm great to. Well, I'm I was going to say, it's great to be on uh, your station because I'm from Chicago. I know that. I was going to say, welcome home. You grew up on the south side in Naperville, and so welcome home. Yep. So Thank you. Uh, now, the book explains in great detail. Everybody thinks the court really took its turn with Trump's three appointments, and it certainly did. But it's really interesting early on when you say, no, no, this goes back decades. You can take this back to Reagan, if not earlier. Exactly right. You know, some people take it back to Nixon, but in the book, I trace back to Ronald Reagan, who, you know, had the idea and was supported by plenty of lawyers in his administration to carefully select who they got for the Supreme Court. They uh, hit a home run, so to speak, with uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, who was certainly in the mold of a, a far-right Republican. But, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor and Anthony Kennedy turned out to be more centrist conservatives. Uh, but, but it started in Reagan's era. And then each with each Republican president, it, uh, uh, the search for uh, justices who would be consistent in their conservatism continued. And you'll remember, Paul, that uh, with President uh, George H.W. Bush, choosing David Souter, who moved to the uh, left on the court, uh, a new mantra uh, developed, no more suitors. Yeah. And by the time we got to the Trump administration, uh, they weren't going to take any chances. And uh, Donald Trump said he was going to appoint three justices who would reverse Roe v. Wade, and he certainly did. You know, it's funny. I, that was actually a question I had for you later on, noting Souter specifically. And he's not the only one that shifted his position over the course of the years when you look back at the history of the court. But the question yeah. I have for you on that issue is that doesn't seem possible anymore. The, the, even the justices are so one side or the other that the notion of them shifting, those days are over. You know, it really is, Paul. You know, we all know our political world is so polarized right now, and the Supreme Court is too. You know, we have a conservative supermajority, uh, six conservatives all appointed by Republicans, three liberals all appointed by Democrats. And just so our audience knows, that used to not be the case. In fact, you know, Chicago's own John Paul Stevens was Exhibit A. He was put on the court by Gerald Ford in 1975, a Republican, and he became, you know, someone who was firmly uh, nestled in the in in the left wing by the time he retired. So we used to have much more unpredictability, much more variance, but not right now. And that's because of the screening process, as you just said. You know, Donald Trump working with the Federalist Society was not going to leave anything to chance. Well, and what also didn't leave things to chance, I don't want to take you into the congressional politics end of this, but Mitch McConnell's You'd have to argue incredible move to not let Obama uh, appoint the Scalia uh, uh, replacement, um, which gets us Gorsuch down the line and then Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, which, which you know, McConnell fills in, in three weeks. My, the bottom line is, is this process so political now that we'll never once again sort of see uh, maybe a Senate leader who says, yes, Mr. or Ms. President, you get to fill this, uh, this opening, even though there's, in the Scalia case, 11 months to go now. I know. It, I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime, Paul, because it, you're exactly right. Uh, Justice Scalia died on February 13th of 2016, and Mitch McConnell did an excellent job of blocking all action on Merrick Garland, who ended up being President Obama's choice. You know, as you say, it was for nearly a year that seat was kept open. And then uh, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, 
in in September of 2020, you know, with really only a few weeks yeah. until the November election, they still got uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett through. And, and I think that the Republicans are really good at this, and they have been good at this ever since, you know, the, 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 the Souter episode. But, uh, you know, Democrats now have taken a page from the Republicans and have been pretty uh, pretty careful in their choices also, because, right. you know, just remember uh, President John F. Kennedy appointed Byron White uh, in the early 60s, and he turned out to be much more conservative than people suspected he would be. Yeah. So, but briefly, with all the ethics talk that has been going on lately, and it's not yeah. just Thomas, um, we've had Sotomayor, Gorsuch, who, you, you know, should have recused themselves or allegedly should have uh, regarding the publishers of their books. Question is, do you expect the John Roberts court to step in and create any kind of court of ethics? And if the, the Demo uh, a more liberal justice was in the spotlight more, would you see a different reaction from Congress? Well, you know, I think if they they dithered on a formal code of ethics, if they had tr if they had come together before all these episodes that hit the news, they might have had a better chance of it. But now I think they feel like they're they'd be responding to a lot of the media coverage. And here's the bottom line with Chief Justice John Roberts for as persuasive as he has been in his life. Uh, he is only one vote. He is not the boss of them. And they have resisted his efforts for any kind of formal code of ethics. He, he himself uh, was originally not someone who advocated that. But now with all the scrutiny on the court, I think he probably thinks that would be a good idea. But you can't have a six to three vote on that. You, you can't yeah. say, you know, only some of us will abide by this ethics code and not the others. I think they really do need to do something, though, Paul, to uh, restore public confidence. Well, speaking of that, what, how much confidence do you think the public should have that longstanding precedent even matters anymore. The Roe versus Wade being the classic example when the Dobbs case came down, and we saw what happened there. But then you had Justice Thomas saying, send me some other stuff. Send me same-sex marriage back. Uh, you know, send me all sorts of things based on what he called a non-existent right to privacy, except for interracial marriage, which would involve him. So he left that one out. But um, what, what are the likelihood, or assault, you know, we see an assault weapons ban from Illinois may very well head their way up there. Is there anything anymore, Brown versus Board of Education, anything the public can look and say, that's safe? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I, you know, you can go back many, many, many more decades than Roe v. Wade and things would be safe. But let's just take an example that um, our viewers will see in upcoming weeks. The justices have before them a case that could easily roll back a 1978 precedent that allowed colleges and universities to take race into consideration uh, for sc screening applicants to, for campus diversity, to at least use race as one of many criteria. And this is a court that I think would be eager to roll back that. And they're looking at two cases right now, one from Harvard, one from the University of North Carolina, that could produce just that kind of a reversal of, of precedent. So, you know, I, I used to say that they were never going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And I obviously was proven wrong once Donald Trump had all three appointees on the court. Mm -hmm. Part of me would like to say to you, Paul, they're never going to reverse same-sex marriage because the, the country has so moved on. Uh, you know, many of the justices know gay couples. They understand the importance of that ruling. But I'm no longer in the habit of saying never to anything anymore. But there's also the, you know, the stand, look, I teach constitutional law, so I teach students all about the need for standing and injury before a court can take the case. Recently, we had the court take the case about the web designer who didn't want to do gay marriages. There was nobody injured there. There was, there was no real plaintiff in that case. But they said, yeah, we'll deal with that issue anyway. And the Mifepristone case, which that's the FDA's world. What is the court dealing with it? And the Supreme Court says, well, maybe we're going to talk about this. Where are even the fundamental I think, rules? You know, those are, uh, those are excellent examples. And I think in the, in the case where you just talked about the web designer who is resisting any kind of uh, services to same-sex couples, that's, that's a case where religion is in the backdrop, even though it's a free speech case as it comes up purely on the constitutional question. Religion is very much in the backdrop because she's a Christian who doesn't want, who doesn't believe in same-sex marriage. And I think that one, they will get to the end result. The Mifepristone case that involves the uh, first pill of a right. two-drug uh, medication abortion protocol. I think the legal standing issue that you referred to, the question of was there, do these anti-abortion physicians and medical groups who are claiming they can bring the case, have they actually suffered a harm? 
I actually think, Paul, that the justices might be hesitant on that one. And I'll tell you why real quickly. You know, when, when five of those justices voted to reverse Roe v. Wade, Justice Brett Kavanaugh broke off and said, we want everyone to understand, we are not declaring abortion illegal nationwide. It will be up to the states. And the reality is, if they somehow make it impossible for women to have access to medication abortion, they will be effectively outlawing abortion in states that have themselves said, no, we want to give women that right here. So I think they're going to hesitate on that one. But I think the other one that you referred to in, in involving the, the website designer yeah. uh, might be might be ruling in her favor, even though she has never she the, the law has not been enforced against her. Exactly. Don't miss Cupid. Yeah. We could have this conversation. I'd love to keep going. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we, we don't get to do that. Uh, but the book is titled Nine Black Robes Inside the Supreme Court's Drive to the Right and its Historic Consequences. Anybody who wants to even think about the Supreme Court, this is a must read. Congratulations on this book. I devoured it all. Thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday with me again. Happy Mother's Day to you. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it.